Hi everyone, your chess puzzle are here and welcome to the channel. The FIDE World Cup has already gone underway with 125 people. And in fact, I'm not quite sure it is 125, it may be 128. Anyway, this is where the venue is. It's a seven round knockout. When it comes to money, there is plenty of it. With 1.6 million USD, you wonder where the money comes from. The person who wins first place will go home 110k richer. We're looking at a 90 minutes game for 40 moves and then a 30 minutes for the rest of the game. If I'm not wrong, there is another 30 seconds per move extra. This event has attracted large crowds and everyone wants to have the chance of getting to that top prize. Who won this first prize when it all started? It was this guy. So he would be the defending champion. Who is there? Not Magnus, not Fabi, but there is Ding Liren, the new superstar. Anish, Maxime, Wesley and Naka. Levon, of course, and Mamidiarov. There is also Rajabov, Grichuk, Nepal and so many others. This tournament will be over in just about four weeks. It starts and ends at this location and what a place. It opened back in 2010 and what you see is the Ugra Chess Academy. Where exactly in Russia are we? I have this location for those who want to see or have a bird's eye view. It's in the heart of Russia. Okay, this is what we have today. And it's all down to the draws. Some very strong players have been drawn to play with relatively weaker ones. And they're expected to win. Don't be surprised if there are a few surprises here. Let's go to Wesley and see how he does against Vegas Sergio from Costa Rica. Currently stands up 2387 and Wesley is expected to have an easy one. Wesley also has the white pieces. So we have a C4 opening followed by E5. Rather than use your lines, Wesley goes for this. Knight of six, bishop g2, and now d5. We might be looking at an open game if Wesley chooses to play it so. So, a transformation to the King's Indian defence. Let's see where this game takes us. Takes, takes, and knight c3 challenging this knight on d5. And if you trade, Black will have nothing developed other than a single pawn, so it makes sense not to trade here. And Sergio does exactly this. He preserved the knight. Knight f3 and knight c6, and slowly, slowly, Sergio is getting his pieces out one by one. Castles, bishop e7, Black is getting there in the end with his development. d3, the moves are coming in very fast. Got Sergio to castle two, bishop e3, and here Sergio chooses this rook response. Lining up in a very nice and cozy spot. Rook c1, and bishop back, and out of nowhere, this rook comes into play. Is this position better for black? For sure it's better than having this bishop stuck on e7. But other options also exist. There is bishop e7, or even bishop... <coughs> Or even a bishop pin on g4. If you worry about this knight being taken by the bishop on b6, let him, and this will be something that looks to be in black's favour. With this bishop having moved out of e7, Wesley grabbed his chances. He went chasing after the queen. Maybe this is a bit too optimistic a move from Wesley. He sees a lower rated player, and how effective is his attack on the queen? You notice he say the bishop was attacked here. Bishop back and bishop e6. The type of move we looked at earlier got Wesley in with a very effective response. This was that move allowing this bishop some leeway. I don't think Wesley would ever consider trading his bishop for the knight, but these moves are not unheard of. B6 
This is not the reason why the knight backed off here. The knight is very likely to go north and Wesley can choose between e4 and b3. Let's see. Sergio saw something and I'm not sure what exactly and decided to stick his rook here on b8. And maybe he was thinking if the knight comes off, this b file would open up and the rook would perfectly be in place because he's ready for action. We still got the knight to maneuver here, and again we see this queen repositioning by black. And of course, even though this may not look clear, what is this queen doing on c8? It makes perfect sense if black is playing to open up your position's king side. There is no other move to explain this queen c8 initiative. Bishop c5 challenging the bishop. And Sergio wastes no time. He rushed the bishop right into this spot. And this is how Wesley played it. He traded here and got the knight to lift himself into this spot. And now with this queen on h3 looking to be slightly of sight, Sergio rushes her back to where she came from. Now, why does this queen move to c8 look to be out of place? Find this, and you're better than you think. There is something in this position, and Wesley found it. But let's leave Wesley aside for a minute. And let's see how you fare here. Any ideas what Wesley played and why? This was that move. He sacked the knight. Is this a blunder or is it a type of brilliancy? I don't think it's any of the above. Look how effective this rook is on c1. When the knight was removed, this knight also came off. And with this pin, white is not right back into the game, but he has plenty of compensation as a result of this course of action. Knight back to c6 and bishop back. And look what happened here. When black cleared up this b-file to allow the rook to come into play, see how fast white has changed things. He closed it up as easily. And once the chaos on the queen side was settled, Sergio rushed this queen right back into h3. So we have a type of repetition, but why does Sergio opt for this queen response? And how can he make any credible threats? The queen on h3 looks very scary, but she's not really threatening anything. If you start chasing after her, then you might have a problem. If she's here on h3 doing nothing, let her be. And this is exactly what Wesley did. He traded the bishops off. And when the knight advanced here, d7 is not yet possible because the queen covers his spot. Any ideas what Sergio does here? Yeah. He went for a king walk to the corner. If you are looking at knight takes with, with the idea that the rook will take, after the knight also comes off, this guy in b2 will come off, and though this looks fine for white, Wesley chose an alternative course of action. This is what he did. Making way for his queen to come out. Knight e7, and rook right into c4. Is Wesley trying to harass the queen after all? After c6, Wesley is a very confident player. He can do it with his queen, and he can do it without her. He came up with this response. And when the queens did come off, rook d8 going after this pawn. By the way, this is worth covering, but black hopes to bring b6 up, and he's going to press in this way. Wesley covered this pawn in case the knights would come under fire, but does he? He did. It wasn't the pawn, but the rook that came after him. Rook c4, rook to the corner, and now rook a4, and this trade is nearly forced. And I say nearly because black does not have to take. Do you take or do you not? Taking could have been better, but Sergio kept his rooks on the board. And when the knight made a backward turn here, Sergio tries to take the initiative. He lined up the rooks together 
and it's looking to go for a pawn grabbing. Now, you will be able to push this pawn, and the pawn is quite safe. But looking at this position of the Black King, that is isolated in the corner with no escape path, Wesley very carefully went for a king move. And you want to see what happens if this pawn is taken. Takes, takes, takes. And after this check, once the knight is squeezed in to cover and stop the mate, there is his attack on the rook. Rook back to d6 and a straight a4. And you wouldn't know how fast this pawn can run. Let's come back to see how Sergio does it. He went for a king move. Allowed the king to escape. But was it too late now? Wesley brought his king into cover. And with the king moving forward to f7, Wesley pushed on with this guy. Looking at the games on the other boards, many of them have finished, but others are still in progress. And boy, if this game I'm looking at finishes the way it does, we will have a very big shocking surprise. It involves an Egyptian player. By the way, more I'm not saying. Back to the game. Sergio responded with a relatively fast knight f5. And by the way, Wesley's up by full pawn. But has he got a winning position? For every win, you do need to work really hard, and particularly if you're playing against these monsters. Wesley's answer here was a very effective pawn push. And what he's planning to do is to enforce a nasty pin. But this is Sergio permits him. And guess what? Sergio removes this guy from the game allowing this pin, but how effective was this pin when you have not one rook, but two of them that can step in to protect the knight? Isn't this what we call a pin pin? It's not double pin because this implies something else. I'm not sure there is a term for this, but I'm not able to find it this fast. Rook e5, stopping the taking, and king back to f2. And when the knight found his way to safety, this guy on d4 is at White's mercy, and he will be removed. Wesley is trying to find the best way to do this. Therefore, one of these two rooks, but let's see. Yes, this is now confirmed. He removed him using this rook. Takes and takes with the knight. Sergei had the pressure on this pawn in the center. But with what we have, not only Wesley seems to be miles ahead, but when you have pass pawns on the board, the position gets also very interesting. King e3 may be asking for trouble. Wesley chose another course of action. He attacked this pawn. When this central pawn came off, b7 was also removed. And look how bad this knight is having it. He's momentarily paralyzed until the pin is cleared. King forward and getting out of the pin. And look here, pinning this knight in a different type of way. And this now looks way too easy. If the pawn falls on c6, there is no way these queenside pawns can be stopped. Whatever Sergio does, or he's going to do, he will be running out of options. What he did here was to remove this guy from the game. And he had to think very long about this move. For how long? Eight minutes plus. Wesley's calculating how to do this. Does he remove f3? And how? Or does he go for c6? If he does go for c6, it has to be the knight. There is a very interesting line of play here. Take the knight and should black go for this pin? Why does this not work? After the knight comes off, grab the rook, and when this fork appears, it's goodbye game. Coming back, Wesley has plenty of time on his clock to miss this variation. He finally went for it. He removed this guy with the knight. But rather than go for this variation, Sergio did something different. This is what he did. He rolled in this check. King takes and rook takes. And it might be down to a single pawn surplus. Wesley has. One thing for sure, Sergio is putting up a damn good strong fight. 
And even if he loses in the end, he still keeps his head high. When Wesley traded the Knights off, right after this pawn was rushed forward, this was also the moment of truth. Sergio saw nothing else in this position and simply resigned. Did he have to? Not at all. It's all about the experience. He could have said I lasted 55 moves plus against the likes of Wesley, but he didn't. By the way, things can still go wrong for Wesley even here. In this case, Wesley had no need to go for an aggressive type of game. He got a very good position out of the opening. He moved the game slowly, slowly, and the single pawn surplus is all he needed. Not always a single pawn advantage is enough to secure a victory. Wesley doesn't really care. A win is a win, and he's looking forward to his game number two. Looking at the other boards, there are one, two, three, four, five, six surprises. But with many games still in progress, we may have more. I will come back to cover the games of round two. So until then, this is your chess puzzler.